Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the opportunity to follow where Jesus has led us uh, on a path to eternity in heaven. And we pray that you will bless us now as we contemplate uh, the events that led up to uh, his message there on the Mount of um, on the the Mount as he spoke to all the masses for his Sermon on the Mount. It was a message that brought comfort and hope and blessing. It was also a message that challenged. We pray that we can also hear those same words of blessing for us and also of encouragement and uh, just words to set us on the way and not to look back, that we might be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Bless us as we discuss this now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so that last episode of season two, pretty powerful message in there of uh, Jesus preparing with uh, Matthew for his Sermon on the Mount, a very intriguing way that they set that up. I had some words last week at the end of the episode to kind of wrap that up and, and get you thinking. Before I go into it, are there any thoughts or questions and immediate reaction to that episode from last week? Yeah, Rick. Yeah, this would be the famous Judas Iscariot that we will meet later on. And so, yes, uh, this is a disciple who, the way they're setting it up, we see a young man who is conflicted which I think is a good way to introduce his character. He's conflicted in that he has a, a genuinely good heart, it seems. He wants to do what's right, but he's also a businessman, and his business associate is trying to get him to join him in a scheme to pretty much cheat an old guy out of his land and use it as a salt mine, not tell him that, that it has a salt there, uh, but to pay what it would be worth that was just a pile of rocks and yet trying to get out of it a lot. And uh, Judas goes along with the plan and the scheme, and, uh, but he's struggling with it. And, and he hears about Jesus, and he's challenged by that and wants to know more and intrigued by that. And we'll see that he genuinely wants to learn more about Jesus and is wanting to follow and wants to make a big impact in the world. I want to be remembered is his comment. You know, don't you want to do something that people will remember you throughout history? And as we said last week, that was kind of the sad irony of the reality of Judas, that he was someone that people would remember forever through history, but not in the way that he would have wanted to be remembered, sad to say. So, uh, all right, um, an interesting character. We'll be watching him and how that does develop as thing goes along, things go along here. Other thoughts? Yeah. The human side of Jesus, yeah, it's intriguing to see how this series does pull that out, the, the humanity of the God-man Jesus. And we often focus on the God part because that's the part we need. We need that God guy who's going to take care of us and die for us, but rise and, and watch out for us. But that human side is also necessary so that he could be one with us in every way except for sin so that he could relate to us and know what we are dealing with and going through the troubles that we go through and experience those temptations we experience and facing it all just as we do, yet never giving in to sin. And that's the difference between Jesus and us. He knows hunger. He knows pain. He knows sorrow. He knows anxiety. But he never gives up to those feelings. Instead, by the power of the Spirit that worked in him, as he was baptized to fulfill all righteousness, that spirit was there in a powerful way, then he was able to uh, save us from our humanity and our sinfulness. So, yeah, I really appreciate those glimpses of his humanity. We can't say exactly how he felt. We don't know that for sure. Chosen Series is trying to do the best they can to help us imagine what it could have been possibly. And I appreciate that, that it stretches your mind a little bit to see things that maybe we don't don't understand sometimes. Yeah. 
Yeah, if you look in the Old Testament, the design of the tabernacle, those kind of colors that they were talking about, you see the purple, the blue, and then also the gold, and all of those colors are the same ones that are always God's favorite colors and what he uses in his special places, his special things. Um, so absolutely, and the meaning behind each of them is neat how they explained them from the woman, the women just talking a little bit and their words about those colors, the significance of them, and that they finally settled on the blue uh, for peace, for hope, um, and uh, appreciated that, how they brought it out. Um, it was kind of neat, and of course it brought out the blue in his eyes, of course, too, you know, but anyway. <laughs> Whether um, he would have been blue-eyed, though, is probably pretty unlikely, <laughs> because as a Jewish boy, he probably had pretty dark eyes. So, But anyway, um, yeah, kind of neat significance there. Other thoughts or questions? Yeah, Ellie. Yeah, the church certainly draws on colors out of scripture as we have our seasonal colors. Um, the green for growth we're in a growth period now the post um uh epiphany season we're still in the season of epiphany but it's uh, now green for the ongoing growth period then we'll lead up pretty soon here just in a month from now february 13th is ash or 14th excuse me um ash wednesday valentine's day this year is ash wednesday kind of an interesting coincidence there of those two together uh but on that day we will turn to the color of Penitence, sorrow, Lent, the purple for Lent. The purple is a sign of sorrow and also kind of a tinged with crimson sort of purple is what we use. And that's kind of fitting because it also moves in that direction of almost um, the color of blood too, of the shedding of blood of Christ for us, his, his crimson blood for us. And so that um, season of Lent and each color I could talk through and we can go through them all. They do have significance to teach us lessons about Christ and what he did in his life for us. So, yeah, for sure. All right. Other comments or questions? Anything else from the episode that stands out? Yeah, I, I mentioned that last week, but boy, I sure love that segment where Jesus is there with Matthew, and they're, they're talking it through, how do we introduce this message, and, and whether Matthew really had to advise Jesus on how to write his sermon, I would be a little skeptical about that, but he could be a sounding board and listen in and be a good recorder for what was, was happening. Uh, but as Jesus finally reveals it to Matthew, that um, here's how I'm going to open my message and the Beatitudes, the blessings. And the important thing about the Beatitudes is to remember they are not what we achieve if we work hard for it. That's not what those blessings are about. If you look at Matthew and uh, his sermon and these Beatitudes, they are statements of what God gives to us as gifts even through the weakness and the frailty that we have. Because each of those Beatitudes talks about our mortal condition and our frailty and our helplessness and our need for him. And yet he blesses as a gift of grace, even though it's undeserved. <clears throat> and I love how he um, speaks through those blessings and they flash up an image of each of those different disciples. And we relook at them and we see them as humans with frailty and weakness. And yet Jesus loves them and chose them with their weakness and their frailty. Uh, that really touched me last week as I was watching that again. Because it just gave me hope for where I'm headed. As I said, if it's about me achieving what I'm supposed to be doing with this new endeavor, I would give up in hopelessness. Because I am not worthy. But he can use even broken people like Matthew and Philip and Andrew and Peter and all of them and Mary Magdalene and all the others. He can use them for his good purposes. So also he can use me and he can use you too. So I pray that you'll take comfort as you listen to that Sermon on the Mount again of how powerful those words really are of blessing by grace, free gifts, undeserved. 
that you don't have to measure up in order to be blessed by God. You simply humbly go to him and say, I need you, and you have him. That's the word that I take for comfort from that. So I tried to jot as many of as I could down there. Um, we had blessed are the poor in spirit, showed Thaddeus, and uh, blessed are those who mourn. Andrew, who was always very sorrowful, especially at the death of uh, John the Baptist, that really grieved him tremendously. Uh, blessed are the meek, and we have little James that was flashed in there, who's kind of this quieter guy and physically weak, but God uses him. The merciful flashed an image of Mary, who was so good at not um, attacking people, even in their frailty, but showing them mercy. The pure in heart, and it showed Rama, this new disciple who was just purely wanting to follow the Lord, giving up her career to follow after the Lord. The peacemakers, and you had um, then a flash, I think it was, uh, oh, um, yeah, Philip, who often was working between them as they were fighting with one another. And uh, the persecuted, showing John the Baptist, uh, who was certainly persecuted as a martyr for the faith, and uh, so would many of the others be persecuted. Um, lesser to those, when are you when people revile you and speak ill of you on my name for my name's sake? And it looks right at Matthew then, who was often ridiculed, and especially at first he showed that rivalry between Peter and Matthew, and Peter was always attacking and even said, you are a miserable tax collector. You betrayed your people, and I'll never forgive you. Uh, Ellie commented on that last week. That was a pretty stark statement by Peter in this message in the Chosen series. And would he have really ever said something like that? Does it fit the character of Peter? Yeah. He often um, spoke things that he should not have said and brashly said things that were foolish, and God still forgave and used Peter including Peter, who himself, on the night when Jesus was betrayed, I don't know the man, and denied him. I tell you, I swear I don't know him, calling a curse on himself. How foolish. If he really got what his word said, he should have been damned to hell for rejecting the Messiah. But God was gracious with Peter. And so uh, could he have said to Matthew, I'll never forgive you? Perhaps. But we can also trust that God, who changed his heart so many times, also changed his heart toward Matthew. And we see that being brought out in this series a little bit more and more, uh, such as when Matthew and Peter went to town to re find um, Mary Magdalene and bring her back, how they worked together. And Peter started to see Matthew with different eyes, a little bit more tenderness and care. And uh, I think that we're going to see that portrayed in this series as a very strong, strong bond between those two characters as it goes on, which would be fitting um, the way Peter operates. But, um, so anyway, those Beatitudes were really cool the way they portrayed them. So I really like that. Okay. Other comments or thoughts on anything else in here? John? Yeah, so Matthew always, what was that? Yeah, Matthew always calculating, always adjusting, always looking at it, and they say, so I wonder how, how long it would take to, to, to share the message through this whole town. And he immediately starts calculating, you know, this many square feet and this many minutes per thing, you know, that's the way he worked, which is fitting for his character. I like that. Um, having dealt with my son Micah my whole life, I can relate to Matthew really well because he's always that literal about things. I'll say, man, I wonder how long it's going to take for us to get to there. And he'd be there on his phone. And, According to the plan of what you're at right now, it should take us 52 hours, three minutes, and twin seconds. <laughs> you know, and he would come up with that kind of a calculation. And that's how his mind worked. And that's all right. Uh, appreciate that. Well, um, Matthew, whether he really like I said, advised Jesus on how to do it, and Jesus changed his direction because of what Matthew said. I don't know if we'd go that far, but um, God used Matthew with his abilities as they were for his advantage. Certainly, someone who was a tax collector 
had a good head for order and numbers, and he was the right man to write the gospel account that he did, the gospel of Matthew, that has a lot of Old Testament references that point very clearly in prophetic um, pathway towards Jesus Christ. I love reading Matthew and seeing how he's meticulous on all those details of pulling up so many Old Testament prophecies that point clearly right to Jesus. And the way he just traces the life of Christ, showing God's hand throughout history of pointing to him as Messiah. So read Matthew with those eyes and appreciate his attention to those kind of details. And it's, it's a real blessing. So, okay. Other comment or question? Okay. I have more on this that I can say, but I'm suspicious that with this being my last time standing up here for a while, maybe, um, there's maybe other questions that you might have on anything and everything. So I'm going to throw this out there. If you have a question about anything else, anything I've talked about over the last 16 years you want to ask me about, or thoughts about what's headed down the road in the future for faith, for me, concern about what's the process of pastoral leadership, concern about where I'm really going, what am I really up to, is it worth it? If you have a question that's burning in you about any such things, I'm going to take a risk here and throw the door open, whatever you want to ask, all right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question about am I going to be traveling a lot, speaking a lot, um, this is one of the drawbacks of this new position is not to travel, but using Facebook and LinkedIn and all of those things, ad nauseum, I'm going to have to do a lot of that online media stuff. And so I am speaking at a conference in Phoenix, Arizona, coming up in February. It's a huge event, best practices in ministry. It brings in church workers from all over the U.S. Thousands of them come there to get the best ideas of how to do ministry. So I'm going to be speaking at a breakout session for that. And... Um, so I posted on my LinkedIn and Facebook pages that I'm going to be doing that. Uh, so it's a great opportunity to go and touch more leaders who can then touch more people that they serve with the message of family discipleship, how to raise up families in the faith. So the key emphasis for this new position that I meant going into, it's the executive director of Concordia Center for the Family, which is focused on equipping church leaders to do the very best they can to equip the parents in their homes to raise up children in the faith. That's the short answer. My job is not to go into every home and help parents do it themselves. I could only do as many as I can here at Faith. I've done the best I can with that over these last 16 years to help you as individual parents and families do what you can to raise your children. I thank God for that privilege and love it. And I understand it. Thank you, Brad. Appreciate it. So I have loved that immensely. But my heart has always ached about what about the millions of others out there who aren't getting this, who don't know how to raise their kids in the faith, who aren't doing it because they don't think they can handle it, who are fearful that, well, that's the church's job. I can't do that. Is there a way to reach them and help them? And so the focus of Concordia Center for the Family is to get to more pastors who are just like me here at Faith, we're looking for resources. How do I do this better? How do I handle this to pass this on to more families? And this is our emphasis then at Concordia Center for the Family, CCF, is to equip those, those um, church workers to have tools, knowledge, and um, passion about doing it themselves. So I will be traveling around to conferences like this. The other big travel point that Heather and I will really be focusing on, because I also have to be selective about which events I go to and where I go to speak. I've already had several congregations say, hey, can you come preach at our church and talk to our church? I want to do that, and I will do a lot of that. That's why I'm still a pastor, and I will still be preaching and teaching. I'll do that. But my highest priority right now in this next year in particular is going to have to be focused on the district presidents of our Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and those who work with them at the synodical office level and in other entities around them. The 35 districts of the, mission of the LCMS 
are spread geographically around the U.S., and two of them non-geographic, but those 35 districts are the ones who are kind of the gatekeepers of what is the emphasis in that district. Right now, some of you have probably heard from President David Davis. What's his number one emphasis that he loves to push? Read the Bible. Read it through every year, right? You don't have to know him for very long to know that's his passion. He also is very passionate about this family discipleship. And he says families should be reading the Bible together every year. In your home, as a family, pull out the Bible and read through it every year. And it sounds a lot like something that I wrote material for not long ago. What was it that we went through here during COVID? Faith Bible reading journey. And I emphasized all through that, this is something you should be using in your home daily. And if you're a family, do it together as a family. We had several families who were doing that, listening to it and reading it and talking about it as a family. So that is a resource that is typical of what CCF is all about. And I'm going to be encouraging presidents like President Davis and others to open the door for me to come alongside and encourage them to look at new ways to put the focus into their local area. What I'm bringing in and why CCF called me specifically, I have a lot of connections to a lot of these leaders already. In my 33 years in pastoral ministry, I've been all over the U.S. and all over the world, but I... Uh, having gone through both seminaries for education, I know a lot of those leaders in those seminaries and a lot of the students that have come out of there. Because of my brother, who's a professor at St. Louis, he knows a lot of the pastors and they know him, they know the name. And my brother, for good or bad, think a lot alike on these matters of family discipleship. And so a lot of them will resonate with where I'm coming from. So that door is open. Uh, just so many things that God has put together where I believe this is a time that's ripe for me to be able to go to a lot of these district presidents and introduce these new ideas into their districts. So this next year, I'm going to hopefully be traveling around to districts and working with district leaders to get them thinking of how to put this into place in their own local district. And the first step on that, and I entreat your prayers for this, coming up February 7th, so right around the corner, I will be in St. Louis. This is part of the reason I'm moving to, Saint, to Missouri. I'll be in St. Louis to speak to the Council of Presidents. That's where the 35 district presidents come together, and um, they will be looking at their agenda, and they have just a full slate, and it's a very packed, busy time for them. And to get on that agenda is almost unheard of because they already have so many things that they're trying to cover. And yet um, President Lee Hagan, the chairman of the, of the board, um, has given me 30 minutes on the calendar to, to speak to them that day about this endeavor. Pray for me to speak with wisdom and clarity in those 30 minutes and to engage their hearts and that they will come along board because that is going to make or break where I'm going in the next year. If I can engage those district presidents and get the hope is 10 of them in the next year that will come alongside and be primary leaders in this. Figure we can manage partnership with up to 10 of them probably this year. And pray that those 10 key leaders will step forth who will walk with us to really take this seriously. And then the 10-year plan is to get to all 35, uh, but to start this year with the 10. So that is what I'm asking your prayers for as I'm traveling up to St. Louis that day and speaking to those presidents of the, mission, of the LCMS. I know I said a lot more than you wanted, maybe, but it kind of gives you a picture and my mind has been running around with this stuff so much in the last year, and it's just God is keeping, continues to pound it on my head of, here's an opportunity, here's a door, look here, look here, Jonah, don't go running away or I'll swallow you up, man. And so I just keep on struggling with that, that um, this is what God keeps on pushing for. So yes, some travels will be involved, but I will be um, in this neck of the woods on occasion, Keep your eyes and ears open. There will be conferences that I'll be at where you can go to. Uh, and I'll be with Cindy LaFontaine at her um, principal and early childhood directors conference up in Frankenmuth on February 15th, the day after Ash Wednesday. Uh, we're going to be up in Frankenmuth, Heather and I, and I'm speaking to that assembly of the principals and early childhood directors from Michigan because they're a key stakeholder of the ones who hold the door into the lives of a lot of families. And we want to come alongside the teachers, the principals, the, the school leaders of our Michigan district and the LCMS. And that's a great opportunity that I have to go and speak to that group of leaders as well. 
So that'll bring us here to Michigan very soon. And on occasion, we'll be in and around, back and forth. So, Brian? Yeah, where the, yeah, the, the place where they think it was likely on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, um, Capernaum area, uh, the house of Nahum in his area, real close to where Peter's mother-in-law lived. Um, you can go and see the site that they are pretty confident is where Peter's mother-in-law lived. There's actually a, um, there was a church, a synagogue, a church that were built there where they believe his mother-in-law lived. And um, so this is real close to that. And it's a hillside that you can go out to. And your confidence level, if you talk to Paul Meyer, who likes to give you out of a five, the rating of how likely this is really what they say it is. One, yeah, not, not hardly, it's just a tourist trap. Five, we're pretty absolutely confident that this is what it was. Like the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, where we know that's where the temple was built. We know that that is um, where it was referenced that uh, Jesus was uh, in the Temple Mount and walking there. The Mount of Olives, where Jesus often went to pray. We know where the Mount of Olives is. And we have about a probably three or four level of that actual garden where he prayed uh, when he went to the Mount of Olives because he went up in that area and there are still many olive groves. So there's some that are pretty good confidence that's likely a garden area that he was at on the Mount of Olives. So those kind of things. The Mount of where he did the sermon, um, I can't remember Paul Meyer's exact numbers on that. Anyone else, Sue, do you remember? I think so. I'm thinking it was a three or four that he would have said on that mountain because there's so much local culture that says, yeah, well, yeah, that's what's always been assumed. And usually when things are accurate, It'll just get passed on through history and by custom. Oh, yeah, we know that's where, that's where Joe used to live. Just like you go to these little towns out west, and they say, well, yeah, if you want to get there, you go to the farm where Joe lives, and then you turn left, and you go to the place where the, the old Ross place used to be, and you turn right, and that's how people remember. Same thing with, oh, yeah, that's where Jesus gave that message up there to all those thousands of people. That would have been passed along by word of mouth. And there's pretty strong confidence that this is the place. The thing that I really liked about it when I was there, that gave me pretty good confidence of it, beautiful view of the Sea of Galilee on a hill sloping down. And the wonderful thing about it, a natural amphitheater. If you were anywhere on the lower part of that hill and you stand on the top part, the way it was kind of like in a little valley too, and the shape of the hill with the sea down below, you could speak at the top about this level and everyone at the bottom could hear without amplification from a microphone. It was a natural amplifier. And that would have been the kind of place that I would take the son of God to choose to speak to thousands of people so they could all hear. Because you ever wondered about that? How did a group of 2,000 people hear Jesus if, if he was speaking outside like that? He also could have been the one in control that on a day where he wanted everyone to hear, no wind, no storm over the Sea of Galilee, uh, no distractions of a bunch of bugs or anything, whatever, he probably took care of all those details so that they could hear, see, and receive his words with eagerness. So great confidence in that sight, really. Yeah. Yeah, you'll see that in um, in one of the episodes coming up. That or was that one? Did we have that one yet? I don't think so. Did we? There is an episode coming up. I believe it's in the next season, um, where it shows Jesus is talking, and then his disciples are dispersed among the crowd, and they are passing it on what he's saying as he, uh, talking to a smaller group and the, the little area is broken apart. So um, did that happen? Perhaps, could have been. If they weren't in an ideal location for hearing, um, I'm sure Jesus could have worked that out so that he was in a place so that 
He could have used the disciples in that way to be heard. Sure. Right? Yeah, so be sure to check it out in the Faith Happenings. It has the schedule for this um, ongoing, now starting episode three of The Chosen that will be starting up here soon. It has the schedule in there of when you'll be watching and being able to talk about each of the upcoming episodes and all the other activities will continue on here at Faith uh, going forward. So check that out. All right, last 12 minutes or so. Any other question on anything in world <laughs> you're saying again explain better that Jesus possibly having anxiety or okay all right so what is the difference really between anxiety, nervousness, and sinful lack of faith, shall we say. There is a difference. You can be anxious about something and not sin. You can be worried about what's going to happen as long as you don't say, and God's not helping me, and I don't believe he'll ever help me, and I don't trust him anymore, and I give up. That's the sin if you ever go to that point. But you can do a lot of questioning before you get to that point and a lot of struggling, and trying to discern what is it you want, Lord? I'm trying to figure it out. I agonize often over decisions where you could call it worry, but I'm just making sure, am I hearing you right, Lord? This whole process to take this call was a huge struggle and a huge process where I agonized over it and could say worried about it some. If however you look at me, Heather would say, yeah, he's worrying about it again. Um, but was that sin? I would say I never fell into sin on it because I was always turning to the Lord and pleading with him. Help me to know you, Lord. I want to follow your way. That's why I'm nervous because I'm afraid I'm going to get in the way of your plan and that in my fear, I won't go where you want me to go. And so as long as you can always come back and say, your will be done. That's your bottom line. If in your nervousness and your fear, you can still come back and say, I'm scared to death, Lord, but your will be done. That's when you're in the right place. Um, so that's where I'm trying to go with my future, and I pray that you'll do the same. So does that help? Okay. Other comments or thoughts? Yep. Chad? Um, I won't be specifically Grand Blanc, but that on um, February 15th when I'm going to be up in Frankenmuth, uh, I will be there and speaking to that group. And then <coughs> that weekend following, I'm actually going to be meeting with uh, the director, the current chairman of the board of CCF, Scott Sommerfeld, who's pastor at Shepherd of the Lakes Lutheran in Brighton. And I'm going to be down at Shepherd of the Lakes meeting with his staff and him so uh, I will be down there that weekend. I'm actually going to be preaching. I'm not saying this because I want everyone to leave here and go to Brighton that day. So that's why I've not made a big deal out of it. So, uh, But you should be here with Pastor Scott or whoever's preaching on February the 18th. Uh, but uh, that weekend I am going to be preaching down at Shepherd of the Lakes in Brighton and uh, gathered with them. So I will look forward to opportunities as God gives me opportunity to preach and teach uh, at Trinity Lutheran in Springfield, Missouri, where Heather and I will worship together on a regular basis, along with our daughter, Hannah, and husband, Matthew, and grandson, Walter. Uh, we will have the privilege to often be at our home church there at, at Trinity in Springfield, but I'm also going to be helping them and preaching and, and leading worship on occasion 
as a, an additional support to them. And re in return, that congregation is going to provide us a home base for ministry where I can use their office and I can have meetings there and their support staff will give me assistance as needed, uh, things like that. So uh, that's gonna be kind of my home base to start from, Trinity and Springfield. It's a little bit smaller than Faith. Um, probably uh, they, they have similar staffing and similar uh, arrangements, two services on Sunday morning with Bible study, um, midweek service and activities. So it's, it's a lot similar to, to what faith is. And if you want to commute there, it's only a 12-hour commute. So come on down on a Sunday. I'd be glad to see you there. That'd be great. I'll, up here and then I'll come back. Yeah. The... Real blessing, another thing that God said, see, I've got you covered. How close will we be to Hannah and Matthew? About an eight-minute drive is where our house will be. So thanking God for that, that's another blessing that who could have planned that or made that work and that it will be a location that will be a good base for ministry as well. And I'll share with this group because it's looking like it may actually shape up. And I'll ask your prayers on this because we just had some things shaping up this week. There's a chance that even uh, my son-in-law, Matthew, might be coming on board on staff with me with CCF to be my administrative assistant and managing this new survey process that we are developing, Faith and Life Surveys. He is a young man who's very gifted with an analytical mind uh, and math propensity. It'll be great for this survey management process. He's also very meticulous on details, and he's always had a dream of working with family that I didn't even know about. And, uh, and we were both praying for wisdom and direction, and even though he's a public school teacher right now, um, he's been having some frustrations in that school setting because all the work he does with the kids, they go home and get messed up by bad parents. And all the work he does with those kids, he can only do so much. And the administration says, your job is teaching math. Stop talking to them about their home life and their family life and all that stuff. And that's frustrating for him. And uh, so there's a chance that door may open. I would ask you to pray about that too, that it would be God's will. And what I had done this week, I said, I've got blinders. I see him in a certain light that I shouldn't be just going and saying, yeah, I want you. So I had him, with me keeping my mouth shut entirely, go through interviews with the guy who's in charge of that whole survey process, and then also with my executive team on the board of directors so that they could grill him and talk to him without me influencing at all. And the results of those this week, both of those things happened with some real favorable feedback that, boy, if we just went out and looked for someone to help out with this, this seems like it might be the right kind of person. So another piece of the puzzle that, God's working things that couldn't even dream of. And, uh, um, but prayers that if we enter into such a partnership that uh, still we get the job done and don't let our family stuff blind us to things that need to be taken care of. So, all right. Thank you for asking. Michelle? Okay, will we still do Marriage in God's Way seminars? Um, occasionally, but again, the time and investment that it takes to do those at a local level, it, it requires a lot of investment in time and energy that is only impacting that small sector. But there will be opportunities perhaps to do something on a bigger scale. In fact, I'm in discussion with a church over on the west side of Michigan where the pastor and circuit visitor there contacted me a couple weeks back and said, would you be willing to come to our church and do a married seminar, but we could make it a circuit event where the whole circuit would be involved and we'd involve all the churches together. That's more feasible perhaps, especially if the pastors and their wives come to it. Because then I can impact you know, 12, 20 pastors and their spouses that can then have exponential impact. So there's things that can be dreamt about and explored as well. So, okay, Brian. Okay. Okay. 
Any of you who love hard copy and you want to see it and stick it on your fridge or something, there you go. Those are back there. If we run out, we can always make more. But that, that is in the Faith Happenings online. It's available, so you can always find it there if, if you want to find that schedule. Okay? <clears throat> Final three minutes here. Any last questions or things anyone wanted to ask about? I know we didn't get through a lot of detail on this chosen, but I covered it pretty good last week and did a little bit of an intro earlier today. So, um, and maybe you guys are just sick of hearing me talk about the same old stuff over and over again. So, lucky for you, you won't have to do it anymore. There you go. So, if, if you're tired of hearing it, but uh, um, all right, I just today is just a bizarre day for me. And this is something that's very challenging for me to step away from my flock. So even though I may not be broken down and crying the whole morning long, it's not because it's right behind my eyes. I'm this close to it this whole day because I love you so much. And I have cherished these Bible studies so much. Even, I'll honestly say, more so than the preaching in the public worship. Because in these Bible studies, I know your hearts. And you ask the questions that are real of, how do I apply this, Pastor? How do we make this happen? How do we make this work? And uh, I love this kind of Bible study interaction. And I pray that you will keep coming to Bible study. Get into small group Bible studies. Gather together with fellow believers and don't just listen to the word, but be doers of the word and challenge each other to put it into practice every day. It is such a treasure, this word of God. And each time I've led these Bible studies, it's amazed me how I walked out having received more than I gave. When I speak these messages and talk about the word, I'm often saying, yeah, dummy, listen to what you're saying. Trust it. Believe it. Live it. So I thank God for you. And I thank God especially for you who are in here right now around the word of God. Do not stop. Gather together around that word. Cherish it and encourage more to do so. Because that word is the stability that will help you in a world that's going to pieces and on its way to hell. Literally. This world is not in good shape. It's not going to get any better. The only thing you'll be able to stand firm on is the word of God. And those pastors and teachers and fellow Christians who hold to that word with you. Cling together with them. Hold to the word of God. Keep Jesus first. And this will be worth it. What I've invested here, that will be worthwhile if you can keep doing those things. May God bless you in his word. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word of truth that sets us free. Amen. Thank you.